not. So that's good to know. Okay, all right. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have um, Ariane Javon Pekar with us today. Uh, well, my tonight, but your day. Um, and um, so from University of Mind, although currently he's at uh, IHS, uh, he is going to talk about uh, Shafarovich conjecture for canonical polarized varieties. Revisit it. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'll be indeed talking about the uh, Shafarevich conjecture, which is an old conjecture, already proven in some sense, uh, from a slightly different perspective, namely that of hyperbolic varieties. So in fact, what I'll be talking about a lot today are final properties. Um, All right, so I thought maybe it's a good thing to just get, uh, you know, start with what is a hyperbolic variety so we can kind of agree uh, on this during this talk. And uh, feel free to ask questions, feel free to interrupt me. I actually quite enjoy that. So, you know, what is a hyperbolic variety? Best thing to do is to start with a definition. I'll choose the simplest definition, which is that uh, a variety x always we're working over the complex numbers now so everything is over c variety x is uh, hyperbolic if it's uh, actually more precisely Brody hyperbolic in the literature if it has no entire curves which is just the way of saying that every holomorphic map from c to x is constant okay so this is what i'll take as hyperbolic and I want to just give you two examples, essentially. I want to talk about curves, which is the, the starting point of this, and about moduli spaces. Moduli spaces of curves, moduli spaces of abelian varieties, moduli spaces of Calabria varieties. All of these, I'm interested in their hyperbolicity. So let's talk about some examples, some trivial examples to start out a bit lightly. First of all, if X is hyperbolic, you quickly see that X is not P1 nor A1, right? I mean, these clearly contain an entire curve, so they're not hyperbolic. You also see quite easily that it's not A1 minus zero because this one admits an entire curve, quite an analytic one given by the exponential. And in the same way, every elliptic curve, right, because it's uniformized by C, is not hyperbolic. So this is a list of non-hyperbolic curves. And this is actually the entire list of non-hyperbolic smooth curves. So this is a theorem that I would say is due to Riemann, Picard, and Liouville, and maybe some others. But this is the statement that if I were to take any smooth curve, connected and quasi-projective, if it were to be hyperbolic, Oh, I already know that this means it's not P1, it's not A1, it's not A1 minus zero, and it's not an elliptic curve, by which I mean it's not a smooth proper genus one curve. But actually, this is all. That's the content of this theorem. These are all the non-hyperbolic curves. Uh, and the proof of this is actually kind of relevant to what I want to say, part of the proof. So I'll just give you part of the proof of this. In fact, if X is not in this list, then X is uniformized by a bounded domain. And this bounded domain, of course, is the open unit disk, <laughs> right? So it's, it's uniformized by Riemann's uniformization theorem by the complex upper half plane, which is biholomorphic to the open unit disk. And then by Liouville, every map from C to X were to lift to this bounded domain, it's called a D, because C is simply connected. But then this would be a holomorphic map, which is bounded and thus constant. 
So this is basically how you see that anything uniformized by a bound of domain is hyperbolic because of Duville's theorem. So this is relevant to what I'm going to say next, because the next example, which is one of the most important examples to me, is uh, the moduli space uh, of Belian rings with a principal polarization and some level structure if you don't want to work with orbifolds. So let's call so let's say AG denotes the moduli of principally polarized medium varieties of dimension G. So if I write anything that's unclear, just interrupt, uh, then this is AG is uniformized by a bond of domain. Hence, it's hyperbolic. So AG, in fact, any Shimura variety uh, defined appropriately is a hyperbolic variety. And I'm going to make this, uh, so I'm going to say one thing, which it implies, which is that MG, because of uh, injecting into AG, is also hyperbolic, right? So anything that's inside of a hyperbolic variety is, again, hyperbolic. So MG which will be the moduli of smooth projective curves of genus G, and now let's say G is at least two, is also hyperbolic because it injects basically into AG. It's not really, yeah, we can, we can say that it injects into AG by Torelli's theorem. And therefore, it is also hyperbolic. Now, these theorems are generalizations of this uh, fact about curves. And these examples, I mean. And, and actually, there, there are stronger statements in the literature. And one very strong statement uh, is that the moduli space of Calabi-Yau varieties actually is hyperbolic. And this is an application of Hodge theory. So if you, if you study Hodge theory and you go back to the work of uh, Griffiths, it. And from it, you can deduce that the moduli of polarized Calabi-Yau's, so I, this polarization just means, you know, an ample line bundle that you choose on the calabi -Yau variety so that you actually get the moduli space. Otherwise, it's not the moduli problem is not algebraic. So the moduli uh, of uh, polarized calabi -Yau varieties is hyperbolic. So calabi -Yau, you can take it to include also obedient varieties. So this is a real generalization of the fact that AG is hyperbolic, but this is not proven in the same way at all. It's not because it's uniformized by a binary domain. It is because it comes with a period map that is essentially injected. It's finite to one. And anything that has a period map which is finite to one is hyperbolic. And so the main example today is, is when, uh, when you replace, right? So calabi -Yau varieties, they, they, uh, the, these calabi -Yau things, I view them as generalizations of AG, but I'm also interested in generalizations of MG, right? So MG was the moduli space of curves of genus G, at least two. So here's a little notation. So let's say that, uh, called CP is the moduli space of canonically polarized smooth projective right these right so canonically polarized means to the canonical bundle is ample and this is uh, for curves it just means that the genus is at least two. The genus is at least two, okay? So I'm looking at the moduli space of all canonically polarized smooth projective varieties. Uh, and, and this uh, canonically polarized means that the canonical bundle of these varieties is ample and that for curves really just means that the, uh, the genus is at least two. So when I say let, let U be a moduli space, of canonically polarized varieties. 
I want to be a little bit more precise than what I, with what I mean. I just mean uh, that U as a variety, use an actual quasi projective variety, endowed with some quasi finite map to this marginal space, to this marginal problem. Okay, so this more concretely, uh, it just carries a family. This is a family of canonically polymerized varieties. A smooth family of canonically polymerized varieties. And the fact that it's quasi finite, this moduli map, just means that every fiber occurs only finely many times as another fiber. So for every uh, canonically polymerized variety, the set of points such that this fiber is isomorphic to F is finite. So just think of these moduli spaces now as sub varieties of the moduli stack of canonically polymerized varieties, okay? And so these moduli spaces are also hyperbolic. And this is the theorem I'm actually very interested in. So this is a theorem of Vivek Zuo, which goes beyond Hodge theory because these moduli spaces don't come with naturally well-behaved period maps. Um, they uh, prove the hyperbolicity of this space by constructing auxiliary Higgs bundles, okay? which is something that I don't want to get into now. So let, let me just summarize quickly what I've, what I've told you. I've given you the definition of a hyperbolic variety. I've classified all hyperbolic curves. And I've given you four examples, starting with AG, the moduli space of abelian varieties. It's uniformized by bounded domain, hence hyperbolic. MG is inside of AG, so it's hyperbolic. Moduli spaces of, of Calabi Yau varieties are hyperbolic because of Hodge theory. And then there's this, say, deeper theorem of Vivek Zuo, which uh, tells you that the moduli spaces of canonically polarized varieties, which means just varieties that carry uh, some truly varying family of canonically polarized varieties, these are also hyperbolic. All right, so what was my topic of today? My topic was finiteness properties of hyperbolic varieties. So let me start it off with a very classical one. Okay, so these are the main examples. And let's just talk about the theorem of the Franckis, which is a finiteness theorem for uh, compact hyperbolic curves, which is quite easy to state. So it's that if you take a compact hyperbolic curve, and actually the compactness is not even necessary, but let's just write it this way. And you take any other variety, then the set of non-constant maps from y to x, okay, so this is the set of non-constant maps is finite. So this is usually stated with y a curve. And uh, the reason I want to talk about this is because the way you prove this finiteness theorem is the way you prove essentially every finiteness theorem in algebraic geometry. So let's first reduce to the case that y is a, is a curve. So we skip that. So y is a smooth projective curve. This is done using, using a cutting argument. So you can, you can quickly reduce to the case that y is a small projective curve. And then there's a step, there are two steps, but there's a step zero. And step zero is kind of the important step to make, which is that the set you're interested in is the set of points on some moduli scheme. So, uh, so. Moduli scheme. So there's some moduli problem, namely the moduli problem of all maps. And this is the set of uh, C points or close points of some moduli scheme, which we call um, C Y X. Okay, so this is a, a scheme representing a certain functor, namely that of all non-constant maps from Y to X. And then step one usually consists of proving what we call boundedness. 
of this moduli scheme, which is the statement that this scheme is of finite type. And step two is the so-called rigidity statement, which is that the objects parametrized by this moduli problem are rigid, which means they can move, which means that the points are, you know, connect components, which is the same as saying that the dimension of this moduli problem is zero. And then you have a finite type zero dimensional scheme, and this is of course finite. So here you see this rigidity, by the way, see how the, the, way, this, this, the way this is proven, step one, uh, you use Riemann Horowitz to bound the degrees. Of maps, and here genus of x being at least two is very crucial. You can just write down Riemann Hurwitz formula, and you see that when the genus of x is at least two, you get a bound on the degree of a non constant map from y to x. And in step two, you use infinitesimal deformation theory. You say, well, the dimension of, a, say, a connecting component of uh, this moduli scheme. Uh, let's write it this way, is at most the tangent space at this point, which is H zero of Y F upper star T X. And then you see that this is zero. Oops. This is zero simply because F is finite. And T X is anti-ample. So if, if T X is anti-ample, it's, it's, it's dual as ample because the genus of X is at least two. Then it's pulled back along a finite morphism is anti-ample and so it cannot have global sections. So this is like the quickest way of proving the theorem of the funkies, right? In a sketchy way, right? So step zero is you interpret it as points on some moduli scheme and then you prove the, the boundedness and the rigidity of this moduli problem. So when you read, the, when you read this, Theorem, you see a compact hyperbolic curve, you start wondering what is really necessary, right? So is this assumption that X is a curve necessary? We have a definition of hyperbolicity for all varieties. Do we need that X is a curve? And here's, a, here's the most important remark of this talk is that this theorem fails for quite obvious reasons for higher dimensional Uh, compact hyperbolic varieties. And it's, uh, in fact, the simplest kind of example you can take. You take a curve, say genus of these two, and you take x to be c times c. You take it the product of two hyperbolic things. Then you see that the space of non-constant maps from c to x is infinite because it contains a copy of c, right? You can send c to x by choosing any horizontal line in X or any vertical line in X. So this is certainly infinite. And um, this is interesting because it tells you you can't expect the Franckis to propagate throughout the study of all compact hyperbolic varieties. But there is an interesting example due to Arakeidov and Parshian, which is Jeffrey, which is conjecture, which tells you actually, you know, there are some hyperbolic varieties that do satisfy this. So let's look at MG again. Let's look at X is MG. This is a hyperbolic variety. It's non compact, it's not, it's an open uh, variety, right? MG bar would be the compact version. Uh, this is a non-compact hyperbolic variety, but it satisfies this version of the Franckis theorem. So this is the theorem of Arakeidov and Parshian. It was proven in the 70s, and it was conjectured by Shafarevich at the ICM in, I believe, 1962, or maybe it was 1964. 
I'm not sure. So the statement is that simply for every variety, the set of non-constant, and here should actually read non-isotrivial because mg is not really a variety. Uh, that's pretty, you know what? Let's let's uh, let's let's make it into a variety. Uh, so this was the moduli space. Oops. Of curves of genus G, but with some level structure now. Make it into a variety. Oh, my pen is a little is losing it a little bit. So I, I want it to be a variety so that I can just write a non-constant. So for every variety y, the set of non-constant maps from y to mg is indeed finite. That's awesome. That's Shafer just conjecture, and it was proven for maps from curves, actually. This is a statement about you know families over y. If you have a family over y of genus G curves, which is at least two, um, and, and, and they're truly varying, then you can only have finally many such families. So, okay, maybe, maybe the Francis's theorem fills for compact hyperbolic surfaces, but maybe it's just true for all these moduli spaces, right? Maybe we should just forget about varieties for a second and just focus on these moduli spaces. And guess what? It's false. <laughs> yeah, it's false for every other moduli space that you can essentially think of. So here's another remark. Uh, this fills for AG and also for what I'll constantly call U, which is a moduli space of canonically polarized varieties. So it fills in, in, in both directions of how you want to generalize it. You can either go from curves to abelian varieties, then you lose, or you can go from curves to higher dimensional canonically polarized varieties, and those moduli spaces don't satisfy the funkies. And the reason is very simple is because of this. The Franke's theorem fills for product varieties. In fact, it fills whenever your space contains a product of two varieties. And these moduli spaces contain products. I mean, AG contains AG minus one times A1, for example, right? So this is a product subvariety, and therefore the Franke's conclusion Cannot hold. And you can choose U in such a way that it contains, well, I mean, what's, what's one way of constructing a canonically polarized surface? Well, I can take a canonically polarized curve, say, M, so a point in MG, and I can take the product with another one, right? So families of products of two curves, they are clearly canonically polarized families. So they, they're in MG. So the Franke's can't hold either. So what I'm trying to tell you <laughs> is that we have the theorem of the Franke's, we have the theorem for MG, and they are just the best we can do. There is no reason to expect any other generalizations. And I think what I'm gonna try to convince you of is that this is okay, but that we should be looking in a different direction because there is actually a very general statement for compact hyperbolic varieties. A general finiteness statement. For compact, and let me emphasize compact here, hyperbolic varieties. And this theorem, I would, I would attribute it to, it's, it's the starting point of what I'm actually gonna try to tell you about it. This, this I'll attribute to Kobayashi, Urata, Kaup, Rodi, and I'm probably forgetting some more, some names, maybe Kiernan as well. And um, I hope I'm not forgetting any names. If I do, just you know, interrupt me, let me know. So let's start with the object X, a compact hyperbolic variety. And let's look at what, what we can actually prove about this. Well, the first thing is that when you look at the Franke's theorem, there are two things he does, boundedness, rigidity. 
Rigidity clearly fails because you have product software is moving, but boundedness always holds. So we have boundedness. For any other, say, projective variety, for simplicity, the space of maps, put a little line under that so it's an actual variety, is of finite type. In some sense, degrees of maps from a given domain to X are bounded. We also have what I would like to call a dimension bound. In fact, for any projective variety, the dimension of the moduli space of maps, oops, which are non-constant, the constant maps are parameterized by X. The non-constant maps are parameterized by another space, which is smaller than X. Its dimension is strictly smaller than X. And if I were to stop here, then you see, oh, wait a minute, this actually generalizes the Franckis. Because when X is a curve, its dimension equals one. And so this dimension equals zero. And so that set is finite. So at this point, I've, I've already written down a true generalization of the theorem of the Franckis. But it goes on. There's also what I would like to call inheritance. In fact, the space of maps from y to x, whether you take it constant or not, is hyperbolic itself. It inherits the hyperbolicity uh, from the space x. And um, in fact, it's a little bit more is true. It's even a projective variety. Just went compact. That's kind of irrelevant uh, to what I want to say. And then there is an actual finiteness theorem, which is due to Urata, I would say, which I'll refer to as pointed finiteness. And believe it or not, this last one is actually the most important one. Boundedness, okay, is one thing, but this last one implies the second and the third one. So point of finiteness is the statement that for every, oops, is the statement that for every variety y, for every point in y, for every point in x, the space of pointed maps, which is the space of maps that sent this base point, this point is finite. And so in other words, evaluation at Y from the moduli space to X is uh, quasi-finite. In fact, it's finite because this moduli space is actually compact as well, right? So this is, this is a quasi-finite proper map, so it is in fact finite. And this is for every Y. These four statements, the first two already, generalize the Franckis. The third one is telling you that this moduli space itself is again hyperbolic. And the fourth one is that we should maybe, I mean, it's kind of the point of the, what I'm trying to say is that maybe we should not try to prove finiteness of maps necessarily, but it's really about finiteness of pointed maps. And those two dimension bounds and inheritance statements are my kind of my motivation for it as well. All right, so let me now tell you what we already know. So I'm gonna pretend, so this is my sort of conjecture, same theorem should hold for all hyperbolic varieties. Modulo some maybe additional difficulties in how to formulate it, and maybe also in taking into account some exceptional low size. So basically, what I would say is read this theorem and try to prove it without this compactness. And this is, this is kind of the direction I want to go towards. And so what I'll do is test this on moduli spaces. 
So we already know it for mg. This is basically allocated partial. And uh, we also know it for ag. This is due to Fotings, Golden Deek. And I can't, there's one ingredient which I'll attribute to Mumford, but I'm not sure if maybe it was even known before. But the statement is simply exactly what I want it to be. Is I take X to be AG, the moduli of principally polarized to be varieties, then boundedness holds. So I mean, that for every variety Y, I'll, I'll write it down a bit quicker now, uh, is a finite type. This is actually, this is the part that's due to faultings in his theorem, Arakato's theorem for being varieties. The um, pointed finiteness, which is which I was should I, I should actually start with that, but let me say dimension bound also holds. So this is that the dimension of this moduli space is smaller than the dimension of AG. So that's G times G plus one over two. And the inheritance statement holds. So this is that for every y, the dimension of, sorry, I'm just repeating what I said before. <laughs> this is that this space is hyperbolic when interpreted correctly, right? So now there's a little compactness issue. Y is not no longer necessarily compact, but uh, let me just kind of ignore this. And then there's the pointed finiteness. Which is the part where also growth in the theorem is necessary. So this is that for every y, for every y, and for every x, the space of pointed maps is finite. So this means if I fix y, so so intuition of this this last this last point in finiteness is the following. So uh, fix a curve. So this is something like this, and fix an abelian variety, and the point here. So fix a point C here, we call C zero maybe, and fix an abelian variety, which is this thing here. If you now look at all families of abelian varieties over this thing, all of them, would you keep this fiber fixed and isomorphic to A? Then there's only finally many. That's how you should think of this point at finiteness. There's only finally many families with one fixed fiber. And this fiber being some abelian variety A. Now, this theorem of faultings go to Nigel Mumford. I already said, okay, for MG, it's arcade of partial. For AG, it's faultings go to Nigel Mumford. So, what about Calabi-Yau varieties? Is it maybe known there? And yes, there it's Hodge theory. There is thanks to what we have uh, done over these past decades in Hodge theory, the consequence of work of Delinia, Griffiths, Schmidt, and Kangzu, that the same holds for the moduli space. of polarized Calabi-Yau varieties, right? So this, I won't write it down again. So I, I just use the abbreviations. Boundedness holds, dimension holds, inheritance holds, and pointed finiteness. So that's kind of nice, right? So this, this, this general theorem about compact hyperbolic varieties has these analogs uh, in the non-compact setting, when you look at these uh, uh, moduli spaces. And so with Stephen Liu, uh, Ryu Ransum, and Kang Suo, I set out to prove this also, these theorems, for the moduli space of canonically polarized varieties. So this is the main result of our work, which is 
joined with Stephen Liu, Liu Long Sun, and Kang Zhu. So let's say, let me write this one down precisely. So let U be the moduli space of canonically polarized varieties, which is uh, what I defined in the beginning. I'll say it in words again. U carries a family, a smooth proper family of canonically polarized varieties. And the moduli map of this family is quasi-finite. That's all it means. So then we have uh, boundedness, but this boundedness is not due to us. This is due to Kovac Lieblick. So we have boundedness. Right. Due to Kovac and Lieblick. Which is that for every other variety, the space of maps from Y to U is of finite type. So this is by now well known. This is a paper from 2010, I believe. Uh, and so the boundedness is not something that uh, we are saying anything new about. What we're trying to tell you is that we should not try to prove rigidity of all maps. We should focus on the pointed rigidity. So we are able to prove the dimension statement, which is that for every other variety, the dimension drops. So the dimension of the moduli space of non-constant maps from Y to U, it's some space, is strictly smaller than the dimension of U. And this, this is new in the sense that not even, there was no upper bound known on this. It could have been, could have been anything. Uh, the inheritance statement holds. Any number of these by also one, two, three, um, which is that for any variety, the space of maps, when interpreted correctly, so any irreducible component of this constructible set is hyperbolic. And the way I formulated here without non constant maps also includes, by the way, U itself. So it includes Vivex Uos dimension, right? So this is this this first component, which is constant maps, is hyperbolic because of Vivex Uos theorem. And what what we're saying is that the rest of that space is smaller, and also still hyperbolic. And then there is something, unfortunately, not as gratifying or satisfying as I had hoped it to be. It's two statements. So the point of finiteness is almost true. So because it's almost true, it also complicates how we prove the dimension and the inheritance bound. But here's what we, what we can prove. Basically, we can show that for any variety, sorry, we can show that there exists a delta closed and proper, not everything, uh, such that for any variety, for any point, for any point on this variety, not on delta, so this is some exceptional locus, I would like you to pretend it's the empty set, the set of points from y to y sending u, y to u is finite. So this is with these three statements are with Lu, Sun, and Zuo. So these are all with uh, Lu, Sun, Zuo. But actually, we proved something before where we, uh, this is say part of A, we also proved something where we don't need an exceptional locus. So this is part B. This is, however, okay, so there's kind of two things you can do. You can fix one point and then you need to include an exceptional locus, but we can also show that if you fix enough points, then you don't need to. So this is with Sun. This is that uh, now I need to give it um, and the dimension, I need the dimension, I'm going to have a dimension D, say. Usually one fixes the Hilbert polynomial of the fibers and then talks about the degree of the Hilbert polynomial. 
So let me just fix the dimension of these fibers to be d. Uh, for every integer bigger than d minus one over two, which by the way, when d is one, you can take it to be uh, zero. Sorry, big or equal. <laughs> uh, for every curve, smooth curve, and for every integer bigger than this number. So this is allowed to be zero. So this actually will generalize on a Kalev Parsons theorem. And at least this, uh, for every collection of points on C that are pairwise distinct, otherwise it would be very silly to include this N at all and take them all equal. <laughs> and for every collection U arbitrary, so here there's no exceptional locus, this set of maps that sent and that fix enough points, namely n points from C to U, this one is also finite. All right, so I'm including this because uh, this statement B, this is also four, but I wanna tell you that statement 4A actually implies two and three, so 4A, implies two and three. And 4B has a different motivation. It implies a generalization of a recent finiteness theorem of Lawrence Sawin. Arithmetic Schaffner-Rich conjecture. So I'll talk about that in the end, hopefully, so that you can also see that there is a number theoretic applications of these geometric uh, finite results that I'm talking about. But I think it's interesting to just first kind of digest these four statements and to see how we actually prove the dimension bound and the inheritance using the point of finiteness, thereby also kind of hopefully motivating uh, point of finiteness a little bit more. So let's prove that four implies two or that point of finiteness is how you get the dimension bound. Sorry, could I just ask something about the statements? Yeah. Um, we've left the projective world, but now a priori, these home schemes are not even representable, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, what you do uh, first is you take Y to be a curve. Then this set is a subset of home C bar to U bar as a subset of its C points, and it's actually a constructible subset. And then you can make sense of all these things like dimension and ah, like that. So but I'm not saying that the, the functor representing maps from Y to U is represented Y scheme, no. Okay. So let me explain how to prove uh, that, that this point of finiteness implies this dimension bound. And so it uses some, something else, namely, which is quite interesting, I think. So what do I, what am I gonna assume? So I'm assuming that U is a moduli space of canonically polarized varieties. And to simplify the proof because of this exceptional locus, I'm gonna assume that this, that this exceptional locus and that delta is actually empty. It kind of complicates the proof a little bit. You have to do an induction argument. You have to first do it on the complement of maps uh, mapping into delta, and then you have to prove it for maps into delta. So let's pretend like this delta plays no role, okay? So assume that U is a modulized space of canonically polarized so that we are actually just saying that the space of maps that send one point into another point is just always finite. For every y, for every small y, and for every small point u and u. Okay, so what does this actually mean geometrically, right? The set is finite. It means that the evaluation map from this moduli space to this moduli space, <laughs> It's the moduli space of maps into a moduli space is quasi-finite. 
So this immediately tells you, of course, that this dimension of this object on the left is at most the dimension of you. You, you just get that for free, basically, from pointed finiteness. Pointed finiteness tells you that the dimension of the moduli space of maps into you is at most the dimension of you. So why can't it be equal? Well, let's say H is a component of this. And actually, let's, let's do it even just like this. Let's say H is a component. And let's look, uh, what do we know about H? Well, we know that H comes with many maps from, yeah, to you, right? So these are a priori all pairwise distinct maps. So if you assume that the dimension of H actually equals the dimension of U, then what, what properties can we infer from these maps? Well, these maps are all quasi-finite from one space to another of the same dimension. So they're actually all dominant. Then quasi-finite map given by evaluation must be dominant. So this space of maps, this, sorry, this collection of maps, lives inside the set of dominant maps from Y to U. But dominant maps from Y, where Y is, sorry, why, why there at Y on this side? I meant H. <laughs> I meant H. The space of dominant maps from H to U, well, it could be anything, right? From P1 to P1, you have many maps, you have degree two maps, degree three maps, and so on. But when the target is of log general type, then this space is finite. So since U is of log general type, and this is because of the theorem of Campana and Pound, so this is Campana Pound's theorem, also proven in, in some version by Taji. Uh, since U is of log general type, which was also, by the way, the conjecture of Vivex, so this is Vivex hyperbolicity conjecture. It's called hyperbolicity because general type and hyperbolic are closely related conjecture. So uh, this set is finite. If you were to be compact, then it's a well-known theorem of Kobayashi no Chia. But U is not compact, it's log general type, so then it's a generalization of Kobayashi Uchiha's theorem due to Tsushima. So this is uh, right, Tsushima, Tsushima's theorem, generalization of Kobayashi and Uchiha. Okay, so this means that the space of maps the space of evaluation maps from H to U must be finite. What does that mean? It means that the evaluation at essentially all points is always the same, right? So for any F in H, the evaluation at Y1 is the evaluation at Y2 is the evaluation at Y3. And of course, this will be true for some dense sequence of points in Y. And so, but then F has to be constant. So if, so if H is not in the constant locus, his dimension is smaller. Okay, so, so, so this dimension bound is proven using pointed finiteness, using compound pounds theorem that it's a log general type, this variety U, so that dominant maps to it are finite by Tsushima's theorem, and then you're done. This is also the scheme of proof in all other cases. So if you just look at all these other theorems I wrote down for abelian varieties, all this, the way you prove this here is precisely by establishing this first, 
and then establishing that this moduli space is of log general type, which is something we knew, uh, we know thanks to the theorem of Kong Zhu, which is why I wrote Kong Zhu's uh, name here. The same goes for this theorem here. When you prove, when, once you've proven this in, uh, for AG, once you've proven point of finiteness for AG, which is, which is due to Goltendieck and Faltings, the dimension bound is proven in the same way by, by uh, you know, uh, taking uh, the fact that we know that AG is of log general type and just re redoing the proof, right? So this is the usual way of deducing the uh, dimension bound. And the, and the same goes for the inheritance. Because it's actually kind of simpler without this delta. If you have non-constant maps, actually, sorry, if you have O maps, then we just take one evaluation map to you. We know this is quasi-finite. We know that this is hyperbolic. And so something that maps quasi-finitely to something hyperbolic must be hyperbolic. Okay, so that's that's basically uh, how we uh, use the point of finiteness. All right, so the fact that there's this delta in our in our result complicates things a little bit. Uh, what I wanted to finish with is motivation for the what I call endpointed finiteness. Okay, so this is the four, four B thing, which is a little bit more arithmetic. I'm going to make a little switch, and I'm going to talk about how to apply or where to apply 4b. So 4b is that if I take a moduli space of canonically polymerized varieties, then uh, if I take a curve and take enough points, Uh, for n large enough, then this is finite. All right, so I'm just informally repeating the statement so that you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so here's here's the thing that I want to uh, talk about. So you can take you can take a, a ring R, and you can assume it is finally generated over Z. normal integral domain of characteristic zero. Okay, so this is what I call an arithmetic ring. So these are, for example, rings such as Z or the Gaussian integers, but you can also add uh, some more complicated things, uh, which are transcendental. And so it's very natural to expect finiteness uh, for objects, this of objects of some fixed type uh, over some arithmetic ring R to be finite. This was also actually conjectured by Shafarevich in the same statement, in the same paper, where you replace objects of fixed type by curves of genus G, smooth proper curves of genus G. But there's a kind of a generality assumption here, which I don't wanna, I wanna keep it nice and vague. <laughs> Can't, of course, always expect finiteness, but then most of the time you do. And it's actually when these objects are parameterized by a hyperbolic variety. So a deep theorem due to faultings is that the set of isomorphism classes of, let me just write abelian schemes without the polarization for simplicity of dimension G. So this is for any G over R is indeed finite. So this is kind of an arithmetic uh, expectation, and this is one of the first deep 
theorems that, that uh, verifies this expectation. And recently, so this theorem is from 1983, actually. And recently, a, a new contribution was made to this whole line of expectations by Lawrence and Solomon. Let's say this is 2021, maybe it was 2020. So for every arithmetic ring R of dimension one, for every arithmetic ring of dimension one, for every obedience scheme over R, for every, let me write just L ample. The set of smooth ample, this is kind of the automatic hypersurfaces D in A, which are basically L, is finite. All right, so what, what am I trying to finish with here in the last two minutes? Lawrence and Salman, they proved this there. For every one dimensional arithmetic ring, by the way, which just means for every number ring, right? ring of S integers in a number field K. For any abelian scheme of dimension, I shouldn't forget here, dimension should be at least four. Uh, for every ample line bundle, the set, of, the set of smooth ample hypersurfaces representing this line bundle is finite. That's very cool. But there is this assumption of dimension one. So I was interested in removing this also to illustrate um, the, 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 the you know, the utility of these pointed finiteness statements. So we managed to do this and the paper will be on the RFF next week. This is next week, 2022, uh, which is um, the very same statement, same statement holds for all arithmetic rings. And what's interesting about this is that when you read the statement as written for all arithmetic rings, then the obedient scheme A does not necessarily come from say a number field or a number ring. So this is a, it's, it's a statement where you take finiteness over all arithmetic rings for hypersurfaces and obedient schemes that don't even come from a number field. So, so we've left the number theoretic world. And uh, well, the way we do this is by defining an auxiliary mod moduli problem, namely that of all abelian varieties together with a hypersurface. And that auxiliary moduli problem is a huge stack, which we, uh, we call the overparameterizing stack of, ha of hypersurfaces and abelian varieties. That one is actually defined over Q. And then we use pointed finiteness together with Lawrence Thomas theorem, together with some specialization theorems, that I established in 2020 to prove to prove this. So it's kind of a combination uh, of all these pointed finiteness things. All right, I think that's that's my time. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Okay. So uh, any any questions? Well, let me begin with the boring technical question. If you can hear me, because my internet connection is unstable, apparently. I hear you, I hear you. I hear you. Um, uh, in the last theorem, or no, sorry, in the Lauren, Lawrence Sawin theorem, the smooth means smooth over R, right? So everywhere, good reduction. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, great. And then my other question was, um, in the theorem with the bad set delta, do you, yeah. do you know examples where you really need this bad set delta, or is it just the best thing you could prove with the current techniques? Not yet. I don't know any examples yet in the sense that I'm starting to believe that there that it is actually necessary, but I don't know yet. So, so this is why, I mean, this, this 4A and 4B, I can't do better. What's funny is so, so what is it again? So 4A is where you have one point and you need delta, and 4B is where you can take any number of points large enough, but you don't need delta. So of course, if, if I didn't need any delta on 4A, then 4B would be useless. But 4A and 4B, they're, 
uh, exclusive. They, they, don't, they don't mutually uh, imply each other at all. And 4a is used to prove the dimension bound and inheritance bound, but 4b can't because you have too many points. But 4b can be used to give this arithmetic implication, but 4a can't because you have the exceptional locus and that, that's a real problem. Uh, I can't do any better. And I would be very interested in an example of a hyperbolic variety that doesn't satisfy pointed finiteness, but actually does satisfy pointed finiteness modulo and exceptional locus. That would mean so, that this is kind of the best, yeah. And could you give me an idea of what sort of things you need to throw out during the proof? Yeah, so what you need here, let me write it here, okay? So I have U and I have a moduli map. So let me first say that if U is smooth and this map is unramified, which means the Kudara Spencer map is injective, then actually I can take delta to be empty. Okay, but the smoothness of U is a very unnatural assumption because the moduli space of canonically polarized varieties satisfies Murphy's law by Vakil's theorem. It has all singularities in the world appearing on it. Uh, so this means that U smooth is unnatural. The unramified is not so unnatural. You take any etal atlas or something. You can imagine that it's uniformizable with the stack, and then it's actually not an unnatural thing to do. But uh, yeah, the delta comes comes from the singular locus. Essentially, there's another reason it comes where it comes from. It's it's from the fact that we actually well, what do we do in general? In fact, our, our, our main theorem is not about the moduli space of canonically polarized varieties at all. It's actually about varieties U tilde, which are smooth, that come with a nice compactification, SNC compactification. And that compactification comes with a nice Finsler pseudometric, satisfying a certain curvature inequality. It's a completely abstract statement. I have a, I have a smooth variety with an SNC compactification and a Finsler pseudometric satisfying a curvature inequality. Bam, finiteness of point of maps modulo the, the locus of degeneration of this Finsler pseudometric. So this delta in general comes from the degeneration locus of a certain Finsler pseudometric. The pseudo is precisely that there is a degeneration locus. And the construction of such a Finsler pseudometric was due to Fivek Zo and Yadeng, basically. Uh, so there is nothing new happening there. It's how to use that metric to deduce point of finiteness, which is the new part. Okay, any other questions? I know, Ariane, um, I know you need to leave early. So um, so perhaps we can, uh, we can uh, um, thank the speaker again. Thank you for, for the great talk very much and i'll stop recording i can remember that awesome